about the sun. Um, my dog goes out every day, and she will sit in the sun, even though it's hot, for about 10 minutes and they get a sun bath. And so I watch her to find out what she's doing, and then I try to mimic her because I know that she's doing something that I probably, I'm not tuned into as as well as uh, she is instinctively. So uh, she'll sit out there even though she's hot, and she just puts her head up in the sun, and she looks serene. And <laughs> So I try to do that myself. Good. Yeah, no, that's, it makes sense. Yeah. And it feels good. I mean, we feel good when we lie in the sun. Yeah, yeah, I always used to. It, it does feel more intense now, though. I, I notice that the heat is uh, its a slightly different uh, resonance or flavor. Well, but there's something to that. I, I've been renovating, and, and I've had some concrete poured, and the concrete guys were trying to tell me that, you know, 20 years ago, concrete didn't deteriorate the same way, and that there's something about the intensity of the sun that's deteriorating it faster. Ah, and you look around, and it's true. There's something about that. So, yeah. I mean, but the thing is, it may be tuning us into another level as well. I mean, yeah. we are physically evolving in a new way. Yes. And it has to do with the interaction of the sun. And then look at Nefertiti and Ignaton. They, they said to everybody that they were crazy and deformed and all this stuff. But they they didn't worship the Aten. They understood solar energy. Right. And then they had the hands coming off the rays of the sun. And they said that was monotheism, and they worshipped the sun. They, nah, that's not what they were doing. They, they, but they did understand how the sun was absolutely crucial in terms of making everything grow, a plant, a flower, and us. Oh yeah, and and that the sun is a conscious being, a conscious entity, you know, in its own right. Exactly. So, and of course, uh, Gaia Sophia is another one, and. Uh, I know uh, John Lamb Lash has been talking a lot about lately about uh, the Sophia's journey, and uh, it's been an interesting uh, presentation of information about uh, what she's up to. So, well, he calls it the correction. Yeah, and he's right on. Now, did you listen the other day? I sent you that that piece that he had made a statement on August thirtieth. Mm-hmm. Did you listen to that? Yes, I did. Because you're, you're the only one. I sent it to about 20 people, and uh, as soon as they went to go in there, it was it, they said too many downloads. So I received it on the same day as he um, uh, spoke it, and he's sitting in Andalusia, Spain, so he's nine <laughs> hours ahead. Oh. And we were Skyping back and forth, and he's just waiting to see how that's going to go. But that's very important, what he was saying. And he also said it in a way that's very... Um, what if, and let's invite the idea, and yes. we can consider it. It's not dogma shoving anything down anybody's throat. Yes, I really like that about him. I really, it's, it, He has such a spirit of adventure and mystery and discovery and reinventing the mystique of the divine feminine, which is right underneath our feet and in the Milky Way. The Milky Way, I mean, oh, come on, <laughs> the milk... <laughs> and Mother's milk. Milk. Well, sure. Well, I it's mean, the milk of Nui, of uh, the goddess. Yeah. The milk, her breast is the milk of the human. Yeah. And you know, the, the Egyptian they had they were they were topless. You know, they weren't they weren't all embarrassed about the, <laughs> the truth of things. Right. Well, one of the things that I really respect about John Lash is that he he doesn't travel. He doesn't do conferences. He sits with nature and mm-hmm. writes and then speaks out. So it yeah. takes a lot of courage to. You know, just post something that's never been said before, because most of us are copycats. Right. You hear something that somebody else said and you repeat it. Well, that's not original. That's repeated. Right. right. You and know, and he... so many people are repeating what Zachariah Sitchin said, repeating what you know the scholars oh, yeah. said. Yeah. And they're not yeah. doing anything to verify. Right. And just taking it on, like, okay, this is true. This is true. This is true. But, you know, over time, I I know for myself, I've gotten more discerning, and I listen with kind of a critical ear, and I don't take it all in. You know, there's a certain point, everything will go la-di-da-di-da, eek, (laughs) and uh, when I hit that eek, I stop and look at what that information is, and often it's something that doesn't resonate with my own uh, cosmic view of things, so... And that doesn't discount everything that didn't make you go eat. Right, right. I'll there accept. could be five little spots. Right. And the thing is, even on television, like they'll take a script, yeah. and then they'll write a line in that makes it look like they agree with the war, or that right. it's a good thing to go and fight, yeah. and then they carry on with their storyline. Well, that's implanting, you know, yes. the agenda somehow in something else that might 
you know, generally be quite fine. Right. But right. we've got to we've got to really stay awake in order to be able to catch. Yeah, those. absolutely. And there's so many uh, violent uh, movies coming out. Just nothing but gun shooting and and killing and murder and uh, oh my gosh. Well, they're, they're trying to lower our tolerance for, yeah, for violence. Yeah. Now, I will not watch violence. And, I and, won't either. And I won't go to the theater if it's violent. I get up and walk. Even in Avatar, I walked out when you know <laughs> you? We we're coming to you know take down that world tree. Oh, I, left. That I was just don't want my psyche exposed to it. I wasn't allowed to watch anything violent when I was a little girl, mm-hmm. and I just never have. And so yeah. people laugh at me. Oh yeah, can't take Carmen to a movie because you know <laughs> be able to take it. I mean, just a little blood. But it's the principle of the thing. Right. I really right. don't want my psyche exposed to it because I know it affects things. Now right. I'll tell you. You know, I've got a lot of degrees. And in my early psychology training, um, I actually did a study, and now it's got to be 25 years ago already. <laughs> I'm getting old. Um, <laughs> but it was on the effect of violence on television. And uh-huh. I, I actually was doing a literature review of research that had been done. And um, half, literally half of the researchers said, oh, well, it's no big deal. It doesn't really affect anybody. But the other half said, wait two generations. Uh-huh. And if you see an average of like ten thousand deaths a week, uh-huh. you know, and you just you just become less and less and less um, attuned to it and yeah. desensitized, and it has horrible effects when you become unconscious of it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Now the other thing is that I I think what they do is there's a scriptwriter's fantasy, so they'll start out with something that's really intriguing and probably true, like uh-huh. Stargate or something like that. Then it goes to the scriptwriter's fantasy where everybody's killing each other. But what that's doing is it's wiring us that, you know, we think we're interested in the positive part and the beginning part that takes yeah. us into the stars and the galaxy. But then they cross-reference it with violence. And so it contaminates yes. the intuition of the goodness. That's right. And that's they repeat, right. repeat, repeat, repeat. And it's either that or it's silly and people are lying to each other. Yeah, yeah. You know, we're having a discussion and we're feeling terrible. Somebody comes in, how are you? Fine! <laughs> you know, and it goes from one lie to the next and how yeah. you keep the lie going. So, there, you know, what we have, when we think, we th- you think you learn from modeling, which is why in the olden days the shoemaker's children would become shoemakers, <laughs> right? <laughs> right. And what we're m- being modeled is how to cheat, how to lie, how to steal. Oh, uh, yes, yes. And kill. And kill. Yeah. Without conscience. Well, because they're training kids on, on video games, literally. Right. The people who are doing the fighter pilots dropping the bombs, the simulation is a video game. Mm, that's right. And that's right. they don't think they're killing anybody real when they're playing video games for years and years and decades. That's right. And then they, they put real stuff in. Oh, it's just ridiculous. I mean, and, and to make a profit, they make more of a profit in a day of war than they do in a year of peace. I, I, that's, I was just going to say, you know, we used to, as a as a group, we used to uh, protest the wars, and I, I guess we just got reached a point where they just uh, pretty much tromped all over us, and we're, we can't do that anymore because we're fighting wars all over the world where we don't belong, and that money, which uh, could you know be used to replenish our own coffers and change the whole face of the world in terms of free energy and, and uh, you know, services for everybody. I mean, it, it's just appalling. What okay, how about be... this? How about this? I did some calculations. Okay. The bailout, if they had forgiven anybody who had a mortgage yeah. and given them their house, the same amount of money that they gave the bankers to put in their pockets. Yep, yep. And, and if they cut the... The military spending, every single student loan could be forgiven. Oh, yeah, yeah. So imagine, we give you a house and a free education. Yep, yep. And then let's cut income tax, too, because that's unconstitutional. All our income tax in Canada and the States goes for interest payments to the Federal Reserve as right. a privately owned corporation. So we cut the income tax because that's just feeding them. Right, right. Okay, well, beast so no to... income tax, yes. your house is free, and your education is free. You mm-hmm. tell me, do you think Americans would be doing better? No, my goodness. Hello? No. Exactly. You think they could exactly. stay home with their kids? 
you know, go to the park, go to nature, go camping, yes. go do something else. Yes, yeah. we are slaves, and what we're doing is we're putting our money into their hands. That's right. And then we, we're paying for our own enslavement. That's right. <laughs> like and when I went to Taiwan, it. I declared, declared myself non-resident <laughs> because I understood that if I was paying 8% tax and making a certain amount of money there, that the Canadian government was going to expect the balance of what I would have paid them. Uh, unless you say I don't live here now. And when I came back, it took three weeks to register with all the places that where I was going to give my money to. Car insurance, <laughs> home insurance, life insurance, utility bills, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. Income tax. Here's where my money's going to go. Medical insurance. Beep, 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 beep. And it's like it's disgusting. And I oh, was yeah. free. And I used to look at my paycheck when I worked for the Calgary Board of Education and say, if I had... All the money that I earn, I would be laughing. <laughs> right, right. Right. Because I was making really good money, but it's decimated, 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 right? Oh, anyway, yeah. so I found a situation living abroad. 8% tax, great, they can have it. You're going to build me a road, whatever you want to do with that, go ahead. <laughs> you know, but utility bills were negligible, and all my money was mine. Everything, you know, I didn't have to pay room and board or, or yes, my apartment. Be. I didn't have to pay for anything. They flew me home. They bought me computers and and uh, cameras and everything. Yeah. And the money they paid me was by disposable income. Right, right. So people said, oh, you must really like Taiwan. You keep staying there. It's like, well, I didn't think I liked it at all. I, you know, I'd been to 32 countries before I got there, and I was, like, completely full of culture shock. Now I've been to 52. Um, oh. But I just had culture shock, something terrible. I couldn't understand what was going on, and I was a blueberry in a strawberry patch. I, I didn't know any <laughs> expatriates. It was just me and them. Uh-huh. And uh, but so I didn't really think I liked it, but the deal was so sweet I stayed. Yeah, huh, interesting, interesting. But don't you find that the human heart is the same the world over? Everybody wants the same thing: love and respect. Exactly. Well, a lot of people are a lot nicer <laughs> in other countries. <laughs> they sure are. Well, I I tend to agree with you. I spent some time in Mexico, and they were the most wonderful people in the world. Just biggest hearts and sweet and. And loving and caring, and they, they they had a sense of family, and and I know that it's like that in many of the uh, romance countries, and like you said in Egypt as well. That's a very old country, and I suspect that Iran has some wonderful people. Um, I've been to Iran. Have you? What did you think of it? Um. <laughs> well, it's similar to. Well, I mean, now it's all changed. Yeah. It yeah. seemed that the women were a little more repressed when I was there. Right. But. Um, you know, they're very collectivist. Uh, the family is the most important thing. Yeah. And they will lay themselves down for their family. Here, if we have a problem, you know, we if we have an argument with our mother, we don't go home for Christmas. Oh, no, right. We're very individualist, and then we spend our lives networking. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> right. My, my, my. Well, we certainly have covered quite a few little issues that are going on today, and and I was just watching a program on Red Ice Radio about the second space program, and that was a fascinating uh, uh, the journey. The secret space program, you mean? The the one that exists without our knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. And um, that we pay for. That we pay for, right? The the one at NASA, uh, never straight answer, is the cover up. And the true uh, uh, space program is already so far ahead of uh, anything that we can imagine, and it's kept so close to the to the uh, to the you know the cards are held so closely that we don't even realize that they're traveling to, all the time to the various planets in our in our solar system that their bases on the Mars, Moon, and uh, possibly Jupiter and Saturn and, and beyond, and so. Uh, you know, this is going to be a big shock when, 